Welcome to the Boom Project Book YouTube channel. Uh, and we feature writers who of the, are of the boom generation, uh, an era that began in 1946 to 1964, more or less. Uh, and we're so welcome today, Bonnie Johnson and I are so welcome, are so glad to welcome Kathy Stearman as our guest. Kathy is the author of It's Not About the Gun, Lessons from My Global Career as a Female FBI Agent. And both Bonnie and I have had the pleasure of reading this book and are so excited to hear what Kathy has to say. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. There's probably a lot more than this, but um, Kathy is a retired FBI special agent and she was the legal attache in both India and China. Uh, and she is the author of this new memoir, It's Not About a Gun, uh, published on June 1st, 2021 by Pegasus Books. Um, the memoir focuses on her time overseas as head of FBI offices in South Central Asia and China, but it's about so much more, and that is something I just interjected. Uh, Kathy also writes narrative nonfiction and essays related to international travel, the current political and social climate, and growing up on a remote farm in central Kentucky, which is part of her memoir. She is, now that she's published her first book, researching topics for her next, and I'm saying several books. So you might want to learn more about Kathy and her memoir by signing up for her newsletter um, on her website, kathystearman.com, S-T-E-A-R-M-A-N.com. You can also find Kathy on Facebook at Paisley Lioness and Instagram at Kat Stearman. Uh, so Kathy's uh, married to her husband, Keith, who helped her explore the world when she was a legal attache and will continue to explore the world with her um, as time progresses, since I think the journey is really her goal. Uh, full disclosure, I do know Kathy personally <laughs> and um, but I am very pleased to actually interview her about her book. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bonnie. It's so great to see you both this morning on a sunny morning, finally, instead of tons of rain like we've been having. Yeah, yeah, it's been that way. So we're just, we're just so pleased you're here and we understand that you have some excerpts from chapters in your book to share. I do. Okay. So we're gonna give you the stage and uh, then we've got so many questions. Okay. Um, so the first excerpt is from a chapter called Hannibal Lecter and it takes place in India. I was the very first FBI official to ever testify in an Indian court. And the trial that I'm testifying at actually is a terrorism investigation that the um, New Delhi Liat office was helping with. So, um, I had actually traveled to Calcutta, which is now known as Kolkata, and I'm going there to testify in this trial that I didn't know at the time was going to be, I thought it was going to be in a regular courtroom, but when I got there, I found out that it, the, the trial is going to take place in a prison. So I'm going to read an excerpt from that chapter. From a distance, the prison looked like the small palace of a minor Maharaja, all red brick and crenellated towers, but nothing prepared me for the medieval crumbling chaos that awaited as we got closer and entered an inner courtyard. As the driver came around to open the door for me, dozens of cameras flashed as reporters jockeyed to take my photo. I stepped out and away from the car as quickly as I could, my head down, Shoulders hunched against the punch of an explosion or the crack of a rifle shot. Reason will tell you that nothing's going to stop either of those events should they happen, but your body prepares to defend itself nonetheless. I was quickly ushered into a room, empty of everything except the tent-like structure, set against one oozing, damp, and crumbling stone wall. The other three sides were blocked with curtains dangling from the ceiling on makeshift rods. Each curtain was divided, and I walked through the near side to find a small wooden table dotted with circles of tea residue, edged with beady burns, nicks, and slashes in the wood. 
Mr. Gupta motioned me toward a rickety chair sitting alongside the table. Madam Kathy, you may wait here until we are ready for your testimony, he said, and instructed one of his lesser officers to bring some water. The young officer placed in front of me a carafe of water with a less than clean glass and then skittered away, wide eyes cast down, looking out at me sideways as if I were a basilisk and could petrify him into infinity with one gaze. I smiled and thanked him, knowing that one sip of that water would earn me a trip to the prison toilet, a place I was loath to visit. I already regretted my earlier pot of tea and the onset of a full bladder should this drama drag on, as most things did in India. My chair kept wobbling back and forth on the uneven stone floor, and when I looked up, two or three heads poked through each side of the curtain. They lined up, seemingly disembodied, one on top of the other, gawking, smiling, and waving at me. I felt like a two-headed calf at the county fair, or worse, a monkey in a zoo looking at people on the other side of the bars who were trying to get the monkey to shit in its hand for pure entertainment value. Not wanting to disappoint, I smiled and practiced my pageant queen in a Macy's Day parade wave. Noting that this didn't seem to satisfy, I gave my Queen Elizabeth limp-wristed limp wave. This generated a few claps. As I was trying to conjure up another form of entertainment, Mr. Gupta rescued me. The makeshift courtroom was another long, cold, and damp stone-lined space with a raised platform set at one end of the room. On the platform was an oversized, once beautifully carved antique desk helmed by an elderly Indian gentleman, his shoulders thrown back in stately command, obviously the magistrate. Perched at the edge of a precarious chair at one end of the desk was a young mail clerk, fingers already poised in frozen anticipation over a vintage typewriter, which probably hadn't been new since the days of the Raj. In front of the magistrate stood a smaller square platform enclosed by a waist high railing, the witness box where I would be standing to provide testimony. Just at the side of the witness box was a row of chairs occupied by about a dozen tiny wizened men, all wearing identical black satin robes, shiny and green with age, topped by once white wigs. My eyes swept over the English style courtroom and landed on something probably rarely seen in a modern courtroom. Set up in the middle of the room, just behind the witness box, stood a cage, walls of rusted but still sturdy iron bars. The ceiling of the cage was enclosed, to my relief, and two armed officers stood at either side of the door, closed with a padlock the size of my head. Inside the cage, a man gripped the bars on either side of his head, his face pressed through the opening as far as the space would allow. He was glowering at me with menace, eyes half closed, mouth turned down in a sneer. I stared back, giving no ground, and with shoulders straight, stepped up into the witness box. So my next excerpt is actually the epilogue of the book. Um, it's called The Great Divide. And it also takes place in Sri Lanka. And the, um, the FBI worked with the Sri Lankan police um, for quite a few years on a terrorism investigation. And the, we actually, the FBI had a very small role in stopping the civil war in Sri Lanka. So I'm very, very proud of the part that I, I did in that. And so peace came to Sri Lanka after so many years until uh, Easter morning, April, 2019. And I had grown to love Sri Lanka when I was there. The people were wonderful. The country's beautiful. And when I read that morning on Easter morning about the bombings that had just taken place in Colombo, Sri Lanka, actually in the hotel where I used to stay every time, it really broke my heart. And this, um, this chapter came out in just, I just sat down and it, it just flowed out. So I'm only going to read a small piece. And I wrote the chapter like, um, you know, more like a lyric essay. So uh, it goes from my actual experience to what I imagine Sri Lanka and Colombo and that hotel to look like after the explosion. So this is the Great Divide. One short year after I last saw Sri Lanka, the civil war that had ravaged the country for 26 years finally ended. I know the FBI had some small part in bringing it to a close. 
I feel grateful that I had the opportunity to work with some of the friendliest people I have ever met. Sri Lanka is an incredibly lush and beautiful country with an ancient and intricate history. I have often thought I could move there and finish out my days in this breathtaking country that I had finally found that had finally found peace. On April 21st, 2019, Easter morning, that peace was shattered. When I read the news, my heart broke for this country I had come to love, one that sang its siren song to me. I want you to know this place, understand its beauty, so that you will understand its loss. These are my memories and my own imaginings as to how the Cinnamon Grand Hotel must have looked in the aftermath of the tragic bombing. The Taprobane restaurant was in full swing. The air hummed with the lift and lilt of conversations in English and Tamil and Hindi, a myriad of accents from around the world, faces both white and brown. Early morning greetings merged with the hushed voices of the wait staff, the swish and susurration of their skirts moving from table to table. More tea, ma more tea madam? More coffee, sir? How are you today? What are your plans for the day? I loved this fresh time of morning at the Cinnamon Grand Hotel in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Generous, wide, welcoming smiles of the people added to the sweetness of my first taste of tea grown on an estate not 100 miles from where I was sitting. A soothing and familiar buzz of activity surrounded me. The musical chime of silverware on China, the soft whoosh of steam as buffet lids were raised for a quick inspection of the contents, the animated conversation between the egg popper chef and an inquiring guest. I always look forward to eavesdropping on an exchange between the egg popper chef and a newcomer. The conversation usually involved a level of spice placed between the crepe and the egg. My own experience had taught me that what is considered not very spicy in Sri Lanka hovers somewhere around the Naga Viper chili on the Scoville heat scale. My first encounter with spicy foods here had ended with a face numb from chin to hairline, tears blending with the snot that poured out of my nose. The hotel staff ran to and fro trying to locate cool yogurt or a glass of milk to put out the fire in my mouth. From that point on, all foods consumed in Sri Lanka were ordered with the firm, not too spicy, please. Despite the lively chatter and the bellowing clamor for yogurt as another unsuspecting foreigner consumed the local spice, I felt at peace. This place, the Cinnamon Grand, was my home away from home in India. My four-hour flights from Delhi to Colombo always left in the late evening and landed after midnight. The hour-long, slow, and undulating weave through traffic on crooked, randomly paved roads from the airport always left me exhausted. I usually didn't get to sleep until after two, sometimes three in the morning. So the Taprobane restaurant became a welcome interlude before my 8 a.m. in brief with the ambassador at the U.S. Embassy. Later, meetings with my Sri Lankan government counterparts would take me into the heat of the day. My morning here became a time to reconnect. I would spend at least an hour chatting with the staff I had gotten to know, staring out the windows at the lushness of the garden, following the goldfish and their lily-covered pond, the lazy circuits of their confined space, comforting and meditative. I cannot help but recall the scene as I imagine the room exploding. Wow, really something. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kim. Okay, we're gonna... All right, so I guess I'd, what I'd like to start with a bit um, after these two fascinating excerpts that beg to, to continue. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm curious, since your book's been out since June 1st, uh, what sorts of reactions you've received um, from folks about the book? You know, I have had, um, this is, and what, this is what I had hoped. I have heard from so many women um, about my book. People have emailed me via my website and a lot of young women, young women who want to join the FBI or think they want to join the FBI and they have tons of questions. And so I, I, I respond to every single email that I get, but I've actually had some very long conversations with some of these women. And one of the most interesting questions one young woman asked me, she said, 
I really want to be an FBI agent, but can you be a feminist and still join the FBI? And my response was, if you're a feminist, the FBI is where you need to be <laughs> because the FBI needs more women. And the only way that it's going to change is um, for the FBI to hire more women. And, you know, frankly, the world is made up of 50% women. So if the FBI were 50% women, it would be a better organization. Mm -hmm. So I've had wonderful responses from women. I've had, um, interestingly enough, a lot of great positive responses from uh, my male colleagues in the FBI, which surprised me because I have fewer responses from my former female colleagues in the FBI. It's almost like the women who were in the FBI and maybe experienced some type of harassment or had you know challenges like that, they're still not really willing to speak up and talk about it, even though there's no repercussions, you know, no one's gonna, um, uh, you know, not give them a promotion or whatever. Uh, it's not gonna hurt their reputation. But I think, as I've thought about this over the last few weeks, I think that those women just, they've left it behind and they wanna move on and they really don't want to talk about it anymore. But my thought is, we need to tell the young women who come behind us, you know, those women who are the next generation of FBI agents, we need to tell them what those challenges are going to be. The good, there were fantastic things about the job, but they also need to know what the challenges are so that they can make an informed decision. Um, and I think that if we don't do that for them, then we're doing a disservice to them. So it's been great. The response has been great. Good. Yeah, one of the most memorable uh, scenes for me, there are many, but uh, is, and I think related to the woman in the FBI is you carrying, a, I think, 200 pound Navy SEAL on your back. <laughs> yes. Uh, as part of the training. It yes. Just, and, um, and there are many other things in the book related to that, being in situations so unfamiliar and so not a girl thing, like mm -hmm. being the witness in the stand while Hannibal Lecter was was mm -hmm. present in a cage. You know, these are atypical things you've done. So um, I'm interested because Bonnie has been reading some of the book too, what her sorts of reactions have been so far or thoughts or favorite chapters. Well, I was glad that your first reading was from page 145 <laughs> because I highlighted that in, in the book I'm reading uh, as being um, particularly telling of, of the the situation. I've, I've found it so honest. Uh, there's no bitterness. There's uh, objective fact. It's very, very gritty. Um, and yet um, the people that maybe come across as real jerks uh, <laughs> that deserve to be treated um, <laughs> that way. <laughs> I was saying <laughs> that earlier. Um, and I think it's important that people still, that people know this still goes on, mm -hmm. um, e despite, despite it all, despite the 50%. Um, no, my reaction um, was, is just gr that this is a necessary book. It's very cinematic. I would love to see it as a movie um, because as far as I know, and I didn't uh, Google it, but as far as I know, we don't have many uh, movies that celebrate FBI women. It's all the, the men standing up in their suits. Mm -hmm. I, I thought the way you depicted the challenges of, that you had as a woman wearing your suit coat when the men could take theirs off <laughs> um, because you knew that the blouse underneath would be like, make you look like you were in a wet t-shirt contest mm -hmm. and those kinds of things are so real and universal and women and can relate to to that so well and that made your job so much more difficult or less certainly less comfortable mm -hmm. um and i thought it was important to to point that out, that's not all glamour and um, <laughs> and dodging uh, bullets. Although there's some of that, but um, at that, it was at that point that I recognized the title was so apt. Okay. 
Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and you know, it, I thought it was important to talk about, yes, there are some things that they are uncomfortable, like being covered in sweat and you can't do anything about it. And it's funny, you talk about TV and the movies. I always love when you see women who are on um, CSI and they show up at a crime scene in white jeans and high heels. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, yeah, that never happens because I was actually on ERT for a while. And when you show up to a crime scene, you really look like you've dragged yourself out from underneath the bed. You know, what? <laughs> you, you wear the stuff that's going to get dirty and nobody cares. And, and um, it's just the, the contrast of, of reality versus TV is it's, it's comical. <laughs> yeah, sure. it's great. Yeah, it's not about the gun. I think I'm. I'm so glad to hear Bonnie has come to that realization that it's really not about the gun. In other words, gun represents, I guess, for me, power and um, being def defensive, being protecting yourself. And in this, the gun rarely appears, except in one chapter, really, when when uh, she's training um, Kentucky windage, when she's mm -hmm. training and she, uh, the, the male um, who's supposedly helping her is trying to keep her from passing and she almost doesn't. So you'll have to read it. Yes. <laughs> so I wanna go back also to one of my favorite things that you've done in this book, Kathy, is that you root it literally and figuratively in Kentucky, which is where you were born and raised mm -hmm. and left. And you also explain your journey, your, your emotional, psychological journey to desire travel. One way or another, you were going to see the world. Um, and, and, I, and the fact that you came back from your career and now you're living in Kentucky for a while, which you and I have said that's, you, you probably couldn't have written this book if no. you hadn't come back to Kentucky. Um, that's so true. And you feel that you feel that in the story as well, pretty much so much at the end. So it's a personal story. It's not an adventure story. No. It's a personal story with adventures. And that's my view. That's true. So I'm really enjoying it a lot. Um, so I would like to know, you know, we ask everybody to give us a, a, a mantra uh, or a writing philosophy. And I know you've created one. Do you want to share that with us? Very short. Mine would have to be write what won't leave you alone. And when I say that, what I mean is there are things that I'm just so passionate about. And when I think about writing something, I'll, I'll write down notes or I'll send myself an email. And then later, as I collect all my little notes, I realize that I've probably sent myself the same message, you know, <laughs> six or seven different times. And so that's when you know, okay, this topic is something that just won't leave me alone. So I know I need to write about it. So yeah, I think that's pretty appropriate for me, right? What won't leave you alone. And can you, can you say that there's any particular parts of this book that, that you were compelled to write because it wouldn't leave you alone? Oh my gosh. Well, it goes back to what you just said about moving back to Kentucky. I know that if I hadn't moved back to Kentucky and come full circle, I would not have written this book. And part of that is due to my mom. Um, when I got back to Kentucky, I actually got to spend a lot of time with her before she died. And I got to know her. I mean, the real person, not just the person that was my mother, but the woman that she was, the woman that she wanted to be, that she never got to be. And I think that that resonated with me so much because when I was overseas, I saw so many women in the countries that I, I uh, traveled in and worked in. These women had no choices, none whatsoever. And, you know, their lives were so full of just poverty and hard work. And I looked at my mom and I realized, you know, after I got to spend time with her that she wanted more with her life, but she was born in a time where there were no choices. And that that just I started to look back at my career then at what I had done and being an FBI agent is still a privilege to me I mean I still look at it that way because 
It wasn't until 1972 that women could, could be FBI agents. And so I was, I was able to do something that my mom was not allowed to do or would not have been able to do in her time. And so the things that stuck to me, stuck out to me in this book were about women's issues, women in the FBI, women that I saw overseas, women that I know now who they don't have choices, they didn't have choices. And why not? Why can women, why are women still being told you can't be president of the United States or you can't do this and you can't do that? Because the way I look at it, yes, we can. And the only way that we women are going to be able to do all the things that we want to do is to fight for it. And so my book, I hope that that's the message that comes across. You know, I want the women who come after me to fight for what they want, fight for their place, fight to stand in that spot that they claim is their own. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my mantra. That's what really yeah, stuck with yeah. me and wouldn't leave me alone in this book. <laughs> That's good. That's so good. Bonnie, do you have any other, uh, another question or comment on that? Um, no, except all the way through, I had recognized and admired your courage. And I don't mean the courage you showed in your vocation or, or had to show as an FBI agent, but the courage you addressed life with. And, and that kind of speaks to what you said you would hope young women would take from it, because that comes through very strongly. And um, I, I think in telling your story, we not only get the mm -hmm. essence of you, but we get a, a bigger, a bigger um, challenge, a bigger um, inspiration to stand up and move forward at, as women, um, it's the FBI story, but it's also uh, a feminist story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's your journey of, uh, and how you did it. And that's what we, we all need to know and to hear at any age uh, in this particular Western culture. I, I agree. And, and I want, I hope that I portrayed in my book that I was vulnerable and I was scared. And yes, there were times when I cried and, you know, I, I am, I am a woman and that's okay. It's okay to be a woman and be afraid, but yet realize that you're going to move forward. You're going to move on. You're going to uh, depend on those people that you love and who love you to support you and encourage you. Um, so yeah, what I really, really want women to know is it's a, yes, you can be brave and courageous, not because you carry a gun and not because you carry a badge and not because you're an FBI agent, but because you're a woman who has the right to be there and being vulnerable and afraid to move forward. That's okay. Just take that step forward and, and, and one step after the other to get what you want and claim, claim what you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also know from reading the book, uh, that you overcame challenges in accepting your um, your deserving of, of moving forward in this life and being there prior to becoming an FBI agent. And I think that's a great message for people to hear as well. So um, I, th I thank you for being that vulnerable and open. Well, with, thank you, Bonnie. With who you are and what you overcame. Mm -hmm. and how you were able to do that without uh, bitterness and resentment and that um, that's not an easy thing to do I know so I, I could see I could see that throughout the book and and your determination to ad address yes. um, life and and make the best of it thank you I, I appreciate that I appreciate those kind words now, my guess is that the, some of the skills that took you successfully through the FBI, the things that you had going for you to begin with, and the, the things you honed while you were in the FBI actually applied to the writing process and publication process as well. Uh -huh. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, are there skills that you learned in the FBI that, that you took into this whole write a book and publish it process? Yeah, yeah. 
Oh my gosh, perseverance. I mean, I'm the kind of person that if somebody tells me no, or you can't do this, I'm like, uh, okay, watch me. And when I first started thinking about writing this book, um, someone actually said to me, he's like, why do you think you can write a book? You were just an FBI agent. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, well, if you only knew how much FBI agents write, uh, they don't show that on TV. And I always laugh and say the only FBI agent I ever saw write on TV was Dana Scully on the X-Files. <laughs> when at the end of every episode, she'd be writing her report out loud. Um, so, you know, and I thought, uh, okay, well, agents do write a lot, uh, a, a whole lot. And especially as a legal attache, I wrote a lot. Um, but just, just when, when you get rejections, and believe me, I got rejections. When my, my um, book proposal actually got sent out to publishers by my agent, you know, rejection after rejection after rejection flowed in. And I actually, uh, one of my, my very favorite rejection was by a man. <laughs> and, and it said, I don't want to publish a book by a woman who's complaining about her job. I want to publish a book by a man who gets the bad guy in the end. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, I don't like you either. <laughs> oh my. Whoa. So, um, you know, when rejections, you keep getting rejections, you have to learn to love rejections or not love them, but just so go whatever. Um, but by the time I actually got accepted by Pegasus Books, I had received exactly 30 rejections. Um, and that's a lot of rejections. And after a while, when your agent sends them in, you just go, OK, another one, another rejection. OK. <laughs> But you just keep moving forward and um, rewriting that book proposal uh, because each rejection was actually a lesson. You know, they would they would tell you what they liked or didn't like. And then so therefore I could sort of tweak my book proposal to um, better represent what the book was going to be. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know keep moving on, you know, uh, if you really, really believe in your story and you believe in your book, um, just keep believing in yourself, even though you have people telling you, no, this is never going to happen. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay. So, um, Bonnie, any other questions? Um, well, I'm always curious about a, a person's writing life, their writing style. Do you get up in the morning and write? Do you write? Uh, do you carve out certain times of the day to write? H how did you actually get from the beginning to the end? When I first started thinking about the book, what I did was I actually um, made a list of all the topics that I want to talk about, or, or like I made them into chapters. So my initial list had about 175 chapters. <laughs> and obviously, um, you know, that got whittled down to what I have here. But and so then after that, in each chapter, I went in and I, I made notes of what I wanted to talk about, what I wanted to write about. Um, and then I went in later after I made all my notes and then I fleshed each one out. Um, and then, you know, of course I had wonderful people who helped me with the arc of the book, like Kim. And, um, you know, it was just a matter of going, I, I sit down every single day uh, and I have to start writing in the morning. Otherwise I, I'm, I'm more of a morning person. And so sometimes if I have a chapter that, that it's, it, it won't, they won't leave me alone. Um, I will read what I've written right before I go to sleep, right mm -hmm. before I go to sleep, I'll read it. And somehow while I'm sleeping, things come to me. And then when I wake up, I'll come to my computer and I will literally, it will all just come out. I have actually written an entire chapter while I was sleeping. It sounds crazy and it sounds weird, but I'll go to bed and I'll be thinking about something. And while I, and I, I can remember in my dream, I'm actually writing it. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I wake up, I came to my computer and I just, I just wrote the entire thing. So uh, it's a little bizarre. Uh, the other thing that I do, like if I'm writing a chapter that is, I remember feeling sad when I was going through that, that whole process, that whole 
uh, exp- um, that whole event, I'll turn on music that will make me feel sad so that I can write that emotion. And like when I was writing Karmic Justice, for instance, I was angry. So I turned on <laughs> ACDC and listened to <laughs> Hell's Bells. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. Like, <laughs> oh, that's so, wonderful. That's yeah. great. So I, I, depending on the, the mood and the emotion, I hope comes across on the page, I'll be listening to that. And I'll listen on headphones so that I can turn it on really loud. And then somehow that emotion gets translated to the page. So maybe that's kind of an odd process, but it works for me. Wonderful process. Yes, it's, it's a wonderful process. Um, I am I'm so excited about this. I, I, I know I've read the book and I want to point out there are a couple of things that are surprising in addition to the story itself and that it's, it's redacted in places, which I thought was, is terrific because everybody stops at that place and tries to figure out what were they saying. So it was redacted because the FBI had to approve the manuscript, right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. chose to leave the redacts in there. I, I did because it's nonfiction. The FBI has what they call the pre-publication unit, and if you are a former FBI employee and you're writing a nonfiction book about the FBI, they have to approve it. And it really is so that you can say whatever you want. You can criticize the FBI. Um, I did have to change everyone's names uh, for legal purposes, but they want to make sure that you're not going to write about something classified, mm-hmm. and. I am no better than to write about anything classified. And actually the redactions, the redactions were not classified. But what they said to me was what you wrote about wasn't classified, but it's also not something that the general public needs to know. Um, And they said, you can rewrite it if you want, or you can leave the redactions in. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to leave the redactions in because it's kind of fun uh, for people to stop and try to figure out, well, what was she trying to say there? You know, what, what could possibly be so classified that um, we don't need to know? And really some of the things that they, they redacted, I thought, okay, um, that's kind of silly, but whatever. And I just went with it because I needed their approval uh, to publish the book, but it's kind of fun for people. Some people have asked me, it's like, what were you trying to say there? (laughs) And so I just sort of, you know, tell them, well, I don't know. What do you think I was trying to say? It kind of becomes a fun game. Yes, yes. And also to end this, I, I want to talk a little bit brief, briefly about the, is that the epilogue, the Cinnamon, Grand Cinnamon? It's called? The name? Cinnamon Grand Hotel. Yeah, Cinnamon Grand Hotel. And there's a quote there that was also one of the little mini surprises of your publication. You want to tell us about that quote and what happened as a result of getting permission? Yes. Well, as you know, if you read the book, you'll see that I love quotes. I actually have a book that I keep on my desk. And when I find a poem or a quote that I love, I write it down. Um, So I love quotes and getting permission for some quotes is it's a, a long and tedious process. But the quote that I wanted to use for the Great Divide was actually from a song by the Eagles. And um, it's called The Last Resort. And so I did what I needed to do. Uh, You have to track down, you know, who owns the rights. And of course, Don Henley and Glenn Fry owned the rights to the, the lyrics to this song. And fortunately, I am so lucky and so thrilled. And when I got the email, I just couldn't stop jumping up and down. Uh, Don Henley and Glenn Fry's widow, because Glenn Fry passed away a couple years ago, uh, agreed to let me use the quote from the song. And what they wanted in return was a signed copy of my book. So Don Henley, if you're out there listening somewhere, I hope <laughs> you're reading my book. And, you know, thank you so much for uh, giving me a lifetime of wonderful music from the Eagles and, yes. and helping a young girl from a little town, a little farm in, a big farm in Kentucky. Um, your music made me realize what freedom, your, it, your songs made me feel what freedom was going to be like. Oh, so. wonderful. Well, that is a great place to finish this conversation, I think.
really wonderful. We, Bonnie and I, wish you the best of luck in your uh, marketing. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you both for this opportunity. I am so thrilled to be able to talk to both of you. So thank you so much. I really Kathy, do appreciate it. it. KathySteerman.com. Is that your website? Yep. That's correct. Yes. Uh, S-T-E-A-R-M-A-N. Go there and buy the book at a bookstore near you. And thank you so much. Best of luck. Thank you both. And freedom. Uh, it's been wonderful having you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, yes.